Langlois. You could say Langlois. I had French in school, but uh, Langlois. And then Langlois. And just like it sounds, Grunseth. Well, we here in Pittsburgh, Sean, and Sean will tell you, we here in Pittsburgh, we got a few French names because of the French and Indian War. And we have butchered the French names beyond any recognition. We actually have a town here, and it's a pretty big town called North Versailles. Versailles. <laughs> That's how they say it, of course. We call it North Versailles. Uh, we have Dubois. And there's Dubois, Wyoming, too. That always cracks me up. <laughs> cracks and yet me we up. say Illinois. Yeah, we say Illinois. So Langlois, you pronounce it Langlois. Langlois. We do say the S. And um, my dad's family was from Massachusetts, so the East Coast. So there are a lot, you know, you might see that name out there, but it's very common in Canada. It's common like Smith. Yes. And so there is Acadian. Is it Acadian? Acadian. We were one of the original families. Um, when we went to, uh, when I was up at Grand Prix one time, it was, there's a gold plaque in their chapel and they have the original 150 names. There was Langlois. I was. Whoa, you yeah. are American royalty too. We have. To, I guess. We're in the presence of royalty. This is so great. <laughs> <laughs> this is so well. great. Mayflower and Acadian. Yeah, that's right. That's the American story. That's one big American you, story. Uh, Two French great. names because of. Oh, Ruth, you're muted. I think. Um, okay. I'm actually in a hotel room. That's why the lighting is so mm -hmm. weird. Because oh. I'm going yeah. off to a family reunion um, tomorrow. Okay. I'm actually in. A uh, can you hear me? We can okay. hear you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because it, it kind of, it, I'm actually using my phone as a hotspot and um, it's kind of fading in and out for me, but oh, hopefully wow. it's going to keep going. Is there Wi-Fi? Do you have, you don't have Wi-Fi there or it's just There is Wi-Fi, but it, it didn't work. It didn't oh, work. And sometimes it's slow in hotels. Yeah. So I, so I just used my phone and it seems to work and hopefully I'll just keep going with. <laughs> when um, we're doing slides. Yes. Um, I've got mine up here, but I have some page numbers keyed that I need to be able to see the slides. I'll be able to see them when you share, right? Yeah, let's let's run through it. Sean, make me co-host, please. Sure. Ruth, you're going first, correct? Right. Yes. We will start in two minutes with the theme song. I'll welcome everybody. And that you know how it goes. Yeah. And um, make a few announcements, thank our sponsor. And then um, we'll go right to you, Ruth. Oh, can you uh, stop sharing your sound? Yes. So we could practice here. I just want to do this quickly. Thank you. OK. There's one slide I might want to reference early on that's towards the end, depending on how Ruth's thing goes. <laughs> Good, that looks good. Yeah, looks very good. Okay, so I can see the page numbers then, good. Yes. Um, yes. There's that slip of paper at the end, it looks like a receipt, and that I may, it's on slide 35. Okay. Uh, that may, I might wanna do that sooner if after hearing Ruth's part. Okay. It's about how we met, that's the story of how we met. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Yeah, there, we, that, that, that I know exactly what, what you're talking okay. about. Okay, so it's 35 anyway. Yep, yep, that's great. Well, we'll just uh, and have fun and enjoy this, right? Oh, th th this is a lot of fun and it's very moving. And um, both of your stories are so well presented in the books and um, and they're inspiring. And I'm, I'm gonna say a little bit about that right up top. Mm. Um, because they're so war stories, but they're really love stories. Yes, Ruth. Will I be able to progress my slides myself? I will do the slides and you could just say next, next. Okay. Unless you want to. If you, well, it, it might be easier for me to do it. And then you just tell me what, you know, order me around. Yeah. Okay. I'll just say next. Yeah. <laughs> next. <laughs> we are at seven. We are at seven o'clock. Are we streaming on social media? We Sean? are. Let's go ahead and open the room. 
high social media. Let's open the room. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our VBC Happy Hour on this Monday, March 28th, which is Vietnam Veterans Day Eve. And we have a wonderful program with two really interesting writers, Annette Grunseth and Ruth Crocker. They're wonderful writers, but I think more than that, they're beautiful people. And their, their beauty and their dedication to veteran stories and to the love that they have for the veterans in their lives really comes through in their writing and just in their conversation, my conversation with them. And I, I'm really, I've been looking forward to doing this program with Annette and Ruth. Annette is joining us from, I believe Madison, Wisconsin, right Annette? Uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Green Bay. A little further north and very cold today. Are in you a Bay. Packers fan? Well, you kind of have to be if you live in Green Bay. That sounds like a little iffy, so maybe yeah, not. Well. <laughs> oh, oh, my husband's shaking his head. I know. Yeah, I'm a Packer fan. Okay, you. Yeah, you, are you now? Are you? Uh, you know, because the Packers are like the only NFL team publicly owned. Do you own a piece of the Packers? Absolutely, John. You does. do, and he's on. Yeah, John does. Yep, and uh, he's a shareholder. Yes, he's I a do. Shareholder. In fact, <laughs> hang on a second. <laughs> He's uh yeah he tells people when we travel that he's an owner. There he is. That's, there. That's it. There it That's is. it. There. Yeah. So my understanding is you do buy them, but they're not worth anything, correct? <laughs> well, <laughs> they're worth what you paid for. <laughs> they're worth what you paid for them. Okay. They are worth some mighty fine stories when you're traveling. We've had people just fawn over John because he's an owner of the Packers. That is so great. We have the owner, we have the owner of the Packers with us. Thank you, John, so much for joining yeah, my us. Husband John. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about that Aaron Rodgers contract in a little bit. Um, <laughs> and then we have Ruth Crocker, who's joining us, I think, from the road from a hotel room, but you're from Mystic, Connecticut, right, Ruth? Yep. Yeah. I'm in Boston right now. <laughs> you're in Boston. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're gonna get to you and your stories shortly, but uh, first, you know, I want to go through our announcements. And our, of course, our big announcement is tomorrow is a really important holiday here at the Veterans Breakfast Club. It's National Vietnam War Veterans Day. It, Vietnam veterans are a special group of veterans. They're the only veterans with their own holiday. And there's very good reason for that. And I think we're going to be getting into some of that history tonight. And tomorrow we are having a special Vietnam Veterans Day event that will be live streamed and will also be in person here in Pittsburgh at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum, which is a kind of a, a unique institution that we have here in Pittsburgh. It is a museum, but it's also an auditorium, an event center, and, uh, and a veterans memorial. And we're having an event with Kim Mitchell, who's flying in tomorrow. I'll be picking her up at the airport. Kim is this baby in this photograph. Uh, she was discovered on the streets of Da Nang uh, with her mother, who was dead, and she was rescued, walked 30 miles to an orphanage, and was given a name by a South Vietnamese soldier. Uh, the soldier in the picture, James Mitchell, went into the orphanage, adopted Kim, took her back to the farm in Wisconsin, where she was raised, and she ended up going to the Naval Academy and having an illustrious 17-year career that included White House aid, aid to the chair of the Joint Chiefs, she was a, a, a surface warfare officer also. And she is coming into Pittsburgh to kind of pay tribute to Vietnam veterans, to share her story and what she knows of her story. And then of course, we will be honoring every Vietnam veteran in person who's going to be with us at Soldiers and Sailors. Uh, we'll be calling them, recognizing them by name, pinning them with a lapel pin. And we also want to honor and recognize every Vietnam veteran who joins us virtually. And so far, we're up to well over 100 Vietnam veterans have registered for the event. We, you do need to register so that we know that you're you know, part of the group and that we could, we could honor 
you and recognize you by name. And so Sean is going to put in the registration link uh, in the chat here on the Zoom side and on the Facebook side so that you could register. If you're a veteran or not a veteran, either way, please do register if you, if you can. Uh, and, and you could you could watch the event online uh, again or in, join us in person. But if you are a Vietnam veteran, we'd really like you to register because we want to be able to to recognize you at the event and then send you a welcome home gift bag in the mail. Uh, here is that picture again. It's the cover of our VBC magazine. We send this out four times a year to about eight thousand households. And if you don't get it, it's because we don't have your address. Give us your address. You'll get a magazine. It doesn't cost anything. We write up uh, wonderful stories that we hear at our at our events and uh, send it out quarterly. And Kim Mitchell is our cover girl here, the little baby uh, on the cover. We have a sponsor that we're very proud of, I think, because of the work that they do. They're Tobacco Free Adagio Health, and they are dedicated to helping Americans quit smoking. And, uh, and they also educate the public on tobacco use, on vaping. They, they advocate for policies to promote healthy places to live, work, and play. And I think their point of contact with the public is mostly through their quit line, their 1-800-QUIT-NOW, where counselors are on hand to assist people as they try to quit their addiction to nicotine. And um, you could call the quit line anytime you want, 1-800-QUIT-NOW is what it is. And you can find out more about Tobacco Free Adagio Health by going to their website, tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. And I've been talking a little bit about the research, on, not research, but just reading up on tobacco use and, and military service. There's a strong connection between tobacco use and military service. I know that tobacco use has often in the past been encouraged by the military. I think it, and I think somebody said that here on one of our programs. Um, is nicotine a stimulant? Smoking is a stimulant, right? Can anybody answer me? No. I think, I think okay. it is. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think I think you know, and so. I, and I think anything stimulant has been encouraged in the military to stay awake on guard duty, things like that. And and um, so what I'm saying is veterans uh, disproportionately are smokers and tobacco users, um, much more than the than the uh, popu American population at large. And so Tobacco Free Adagio Health really wants to target veteran smokers. And we're going to do a program with them, aren't we, Sean, with Tobacco Free Adagio Health a scuttlebutt conversation about tobacco use in the military. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, actually connected with uh, Don Nemchek, who said he used to be a smoker. Thought it'd be a good opportunity to have a veteran on who was a smoker, who has since quit, um, and talk with uh, them uh, about their experience along with Adagio and all the programs that they that they provide. So Don Nemchek, are you with us here tonight? He usually does join us. I can't see if he's with us tonight or not. Yes, uh, Todd. Good evening. How are you doing? So, Don, did the Navy teach you how to smoke, or was that a was that a skill that you learned on the streets of McKeesport? Uh, yeah, actually, a very interesting story. My father used to take me. I was about ten years old, up to my uncle's place. His brother, he was one of his barbers who worked out of his living room. They always had a Pall Mall cigarette hanging out of their lip. And as I was sitting in a chair getting a trim, he goes, "Here, Donnie, go ahead, take a puff. You'll be all right." <laughs> I was able to follow up with a little glass of Iron City, and we were good to go at an early age. So uh, by the time I got into the Navy, uh, smoking was a part of my daily routine, actually. And uh, I have some stories to tell about it uh, when uh, we convene in uh, April. And of course, uh, many of us remember the terms, uh, you know, smoke them if you got them, and uh, the smoking lamp is lit through all authorized spaces. And cigarettes were a, a very uh, integral part of our day. So uh, I'm trying to compile some things together, get some notes, and uh, I'll be ready to go on April 12th. This is great. Thank you so much, Don. And I think I, that, I, I think, I, yeah, John. Yeah, I think there was a saying in World War One: cigarettes out and over the top, <laughs> which meant it was time to put your cigarettes out and get out of the trenches and get over the top. And I mean, what else are you going to do in a trench? You're going to sit and talk and smoke. Right. Um, so the smoking lamp on a ship, that was an actual light. And when it was lit, no. 
No, uh, Todd, what it was back in the, I guess, the sailing days, there was a formal smoking lamp. That's where everybody lit their cigarettes and things. So there's a burning thing. And it just caught on in Navy jargon. So when they came over the one uh, MC, the microphone, of the, the announcement of the ship, uh, they would say the smoking lamp is lit. I want a carrier. So there's a very, very a controlled time and place where <laughs> one could smoke considering all the jet fuel and all the other stuff that's uh, abundant on a carrier. But uh, the smoking lamp is lit is a common term in the Navy. I'm sure some of my other sailors can relate to it. That is so funny, Don, that all these years I've heard that term. I've actually thought it was an actual <laughs> lamp <laughs> lamp that was turned on, on on a ship. And it's just an idiom. It's just a rhetorical phrase. Oh, is that funny? Thank you for educating me. Man, after I'm doing, I've been doing this, I've been working with veterans for 14 years and every single program I learned something new. Um, Sean, we have a new scuttlebutt out today. We do. Sorry, I was responding to Brad who mentioned that I look a little, I got a little baby face going on today. I don't ever go full clean shaven. I know that this uh, frowned upon in the military to have some scruff, but it's just like, it's my brand. I have to keep with it. But <laughs> our scuttlebutt uh, this week um, is actually a supercut of a recent happy hour. If you were not there the night that Phyllis Wilson and Elizabeth Anhelm Frazier joined us uh, for an incredible conversation, uh, boy, uh, this is a great way to watch it. Um, we uh, uh, cut down the episode of Happy Hour into about a, uh, I'd say about a 70 minute episode of, of focusing in on both of their stories and what we talked talk with them about. Um, it's a it's a great watch. Check it out at uh, I'll put the link in the in the chat here, veteransbreakfastclub.org forward slash scuttlebutt. You can go to the YouTube channel and check it out there. Um, thought it was a great way to um, sort of hit a different audience. We usually have a, a really great audience here on, on Happy Hour and maybe some other people watch the scuttlebutt. So we thought yeah, this is a great time to echo what they were talking about and then sort of blast it out again. Yeah. Two incredibly inspiring people with one wonderful energy to their stories. Uh, I do want to let people know we are having our final coffee hour for a while uh, on Wednesday, March 30th, and we're going to have uh, Gary Bridges, Colonel Gary Bridges, uh, an Army colonel who was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and he went on to command an air mobile battalion in, in Desert Storm. He goes by the name Matt Jackson. His name, his pen name is Matt Jackson, and man, are his books popular. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm a writer. I, I mean, this guy sells books and uh, there are action stories from the past. And, uh, and, and it's in these books where he captures the world of air mobile assault. Uh, so he's going to be joining us talking about all things air mobile past and present on Wednesday morning. And the coffee hour is going on hiatus uh, after at the end of March, because we're going to start up our in-person programs again. So when we do our in-person programs, we usually do them on Wednesday mornings. So we're not going to be doing our coffee hours Wednesday mornings. We'll have to pick that up probably later in the year at some point. Um, do we have any other announcements before we get to Ruth Crocker and her story? We're going to start with Ruth, go to Annette, and then open it up for conversation. Do we have any other announcements or... John Crawl, good to see you. John, uh, Bob McCormick, Jack Morrow, wonderful to see you. Um, I haven't seen you in a while. Laura, you are related to Annette, I bet. Yeah. Very good. How yeah, do you pronounce so. your last name? Uh, there's a lot of variations. I usually roll with lingua. But, you um, say lingua. Yeah. So Annette's maiden name was Langlois or yeah. yeah Langlois is what we would say here in Pittsburgh um but it's French of course and in French it's Langlois that's good I'm glad that somebody's keeping up that tradition um Dennis Voitek good to see you thank you for joining us Rick Weber good to see you all right Carol Wagoner hello are you related to somebody here well I'm I'm from Green Bay also I hate to say that to you, but I'm a big old Packer fan, and I met Annette through my UW Madison alumni magazine, and we just connected like that because I'm yeah. writing a book about my about Vietnam also, and my husband's letters 
and her book was the closest I've ever seen to my book. Plus, she was at the UW-Madison campus the same time I was. It's just amazing, the same year and everything. That is so cool. Um, Carol, so you're, is your husband still with us? Yes, he, um, he's a Vietnam vet. He was there from 68 to 69. And we were married. I was only like 19, but we were already married. And we have like 300 letters we saved in shoeboxes. And <laughs> when I retired, I joined a writer's club. And I got an idea that I could write a book about that. It's taken me seven years, but I'm looking for a publisher right now. And we're in our final edit and it's coming along really well. Carol, so, that is so wonderful. Talk about inspiring. I'm constantly telling people who come to our events, veterans, don't throw away any letters. Don't throw away anything. Save them. These are all important historical documents. And it's so wonderful that you've recognized the value of, uh, of, of the letters that you and your husband wrote back and forth to each other. I, I'd, be, I'd love to have you come on our program sometime and talk about that, talk about your experience. So I'm going to let people know, if you have not joined our programs before, give, send me an email, Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org, Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. Carol, that's an order to you, because I want to... Um, make sure that uh, you get a copy of the magazine and make sure that I'm able to contact you for you to come on and talk about your own, your own work and research. So thank you very much for introducing yourself. Ruth, let's start with you and your story. Um, I've just got to warn people, you're, this is, uh, it's not an easy story. Uh, your, your husband, David Crocker, uh, uh, and a West Point graduate, uh, you got married in June 1966, and less than three years later, he was killed in Vietnam. And a lot of your story is your struggle with being a Gold Star wife at a time when the war was quite unpopular, and uh, people simply didn't want to talk about it. So um, I'm going to start sharing. You very kindly have sent you uh, a... a uh, your PowerPoint. So I'll be, I'll sharing, uh, I'm sharing the screen here and uh, you can start uh, talking about okay, your book. Thank you. thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I have great memories of the podcast that we did years ago and it was a very enjoyable experience. And, you know, um, the title of my book is uh, Those Who Remain, which was a line from one of my husband's poems actually. And I added remembrance and reunion after war because um, it was, I'm sure for many of you who are out there tonight, remember that there was this long silence that followed the Vietnam War. And it was true for um, many people, but for me personally, I remember that it was just, I mean, how could you talk about this? I didn't even when it, when, uh, when uh, Dave was killed, I, I didn't really fully understand even what was going on there. So um, eventually there was a change in the atmosphere. And today, now there's an awareness of how important it is for survivors to tell their stories. But it takes time to process significant life events and, and you know, even figuring out where to start. So next slide. Um, one of the benefits for me in writing my story was, though, finally, and I'll tell you about how that happened in a minute, um, was that I reconnected with many people that I would never have connected with. And this photo is of some of the members of my husband's class um, who, that graduated in 1966 from a classmate who attended one of my first public presentations about my memoir. And he's over there on the right-hand side. My husband's in the front row. He's the second from uh, um, the right. It's kind of hard to point. I can probably point it out when he was my pointer here. And Wes Clark, who was in the class, who ran for president, if you remember, way back. Oh, wow, uh, he was in the same class. And Wes was actually the, uh, the best man at our wedding. Um, wow. And uh, he's one of the really the few people who kind of stayed in touch with me over the years. But in Dave's class, 
um, 33 members of Dave's class would be killed in Vietnam. And out of all West Point graduates, actually um, 273 were killed in Vietnam. Um, so <clears throat> next slide. I met Dave on, um, in March of 1965, which is kind of ironic. Uh, I met him at a, uh, on a blind date at a cadet exchange because I lived near the Coast Guard Academy and the, they would send cadets to various um, academies to see how the other half lived. And, uh, um, but March was also um, the, when the first Marines arrived in Vietnam, the first boots on the ground. And of course that was something happening that I was totally unaware of. And I don't, I don't even know if Dave was aware. Um, but anyway, I was 18, a freshman in college. And, <clears throat> but by that fall, um, Dave, and, Dave and I fell in love and we were already, by the fall, we were already planning to get married the next year, but Dave's father was sent to Vietnam as a battalion commander. And uh, so he was there from around September of 65 to September of 66. And um, next slide. He was not able to come back for Dave's graduation on June 8th. Uh, 66, or our wedding that we, uh, the next day. Um, but I, I do remember Dave and his father sitting together for many long talks, uh, um, which I'm sure were about, you know, what had happened, what he had seen in Vietnam. But we, uh, next slide, we actually um, spent two years Dave's first duty station was in Wielfleck in Germany. And then we went to Würzburg where basically, you know, soldiers in the infantry were training in the, in the snow uh, in the mountains of, of um, Germany for the jungles of Vietnam. And Dave advanced very quickly from second Lieutenant to captain. And um, by then we all, we knew that Vietnam was going to be his next assignment. But I, I remember feeling totally in the dark, because um, actually the, the only source of real information about anything was, uh, was the army newspaper in Germany. Um, and even letters from my family, they, no one really knew what was going on. So, um, and the most that Dave would com communicate to me about the war was that he was going and he was going to try to keep his, his man safe and I don't recall him ever saying a negative word about who they would be fighting, but in um, he left uh, for Vietnam uh, on Veterans Day, 1968, November 11th, and he was killed on May 17th, 1969, two weeks before we were supposed to meet for his first R and R, and he was um, killed in a in a booby trapped Viet Cong bunker in Tay Ninh uh, province. And next slide. But before we went home from Europe um, in the summer of 68, Dave had finally taken some of his huge backlog of accumulated leave. And we went to Grindelwald, Switzerland. Um, and he showed me this mountain that he hoped to climb someday. And I never, before I met Dave, I'd never even slept in a tent. But by the time, you know, we left Germany and came back, he had introduced me to ice uh, climbing and rock climbing and camping in snow. And after Dave was killed, in my devastation, I decided that he had to go to the mountain that he loved. So instead of him being buried, um, the coffin at his funeral uh, was filled with all the things that I felt would be too painful to ever see or touch again, um, including his letters, all his letters. He had written hundreds of letters to me over the four years that we knew each other and my wedding dress and his uniforms and other memorabilia. Um, and actually, Bruce, I went I, to- Bruce, can I interrupt you? I'm sorry. Sure. You buried those letters. Yes. In your wedding dress. Yeah. And photos? Photos too, in scrapbooks. And scrapbooks. scrapbooks. You put them in the coffin casket? And buried yeah. them. Yeah, Why? it was a, 
Well, I, I just felt like I was so devastated that I felt like, how would I ever deal with these things again? And of course, I made this decision within like two or three days of, of being informed about his death. But it was something that made me feel like I had some modicum of control over this uncontrollable situation. And I decided, what am I going to do? What's going to happen to me? I don't know. I'll just, I'm going to put these in. I'm going to put them in a safe place. I also had the benefit of having a great relationship with the funeral director. He, um, I lived in a small town and this, this, this really wonderful man had presided at all our family. And so I went down and talked to him and I said, can I do this? And he said, sure, but uh, just remember, you can't dig them up. You can't dig it up. <laughs> so. Um, can you remind we, us we how old you were? How old were you at this point? Uh, I was 22. You were 22 years old. You'd been married, not even three years. You lost your husband in war. Um, and you decide you're going to throw all your associations with him away, essentially bury them. Ken, you're shaking your head. No. Ken Riziki. Um, no, I just didn't like what your terminology was throwing them away. I don't, I don't think that they were thrown away. You're right. Um, they sorry. weren't thrown away. They, no, you're right. They, they, they were consecrated or they, I mean, they were put away. Were you hoping to kind of bury the whole experience? No, I, you know, I kept certain things. I kept a couple of letters that were, um, you know, that were, so that I'd have a sample of, I'd have Dave's handwriting. I kept, I did keep our wedding pictures um, okay. album, but it was just that there were all this stuff that I felt like, how can I handle this? What am I going to do? You know, and it was a, really snap decision but actually it was it was the only way that I felt like I could be in charge of and, and also David said at some point in our relationship that he didn't want to be buried and so I said all of a sudden I can't I mean he didn't want that anyway so um, I'll do this and what did you do with his ashes well then his sister and I took his ashes that summer in um, August to the Eiger. And we, uh, we climbed up as far as we could and into the, we were in the snow fields and cause he had wanted to, he, this was one of his pictures. He had wanted to do this climb of the North face, which was, you know, very treacherous. So we didn't get up there, but we got into the snow fields and found this spot and we, left his ashes there and uh and it and you know i didn't tell people except for our families knew and and everyone in the family really felt that it was a good decision um so um the next slide okay. uh in 1975 i remarried and i had a son oh. yep i had a son uh, who was born in 78, Noah Bean. And Noah was um, really embraced by the Crocker family as a grandchild. And he knew the story of Dave. And as he grew up, uh, he, he began, when he was in high school, he, he was very interested in theater, doing a lot of writing. And he, and he started needling me about writing my story. He says, mom, you got to write about this. You have to write about this. So Steven Spielberg is finding all the Holocaust survivors and getting them to tell their story and you got to do this. So I, I thought I hadn't even thought about that, but I said, okay, I still can't really talk about it. So why not write about it? So first I wrote a play and it was a kind of a fictionalized version of what, what I'd done with the letters and it was set in Vietnam. And, and I had never met another Vietnam widow. Um, but um, the play actually was produced at this sort of little famous theater in New London, the Eugene O'Neill Theater. And a lot of Vietnam veterans came to see the play. And that was the first contact that I had had even with Vietnam veterans. And people were, it was a little one act play, but people were in tears. And I was kind of shocked, you know, that I was making this contact. Um, 
so I kept writing and uh, writing. I, I started writing pieces of the story and uh, next slide. And then years went by and um, I stayed very close to the Crocker family. And in 2005, uh, Dave's brother, Tom called me and he said he had been searching the internet for Dave's name. And he discovered all these tributes to Dave on the virtual wall. And he had contacted some of these guys and they um, started talking about Dave and what a great leader he had been and how he had saved them in so many different situations. And so Tom, um, and they invited, they, they said, you, you have to come to one of our reunions. And so Tom called me and he said, you want to go? And I said, I was terrified really at the idea of meeting, you know, people who um, had been that close to Dave. Um, and I, you know, afraid, I didn't know what my reaction would be. Um, so they said, we're having the next, it, it was a, a, a reunion of the regiment. So there are a lot of other people there other than the, the guys of the uh, A company of the second 22nd. Um, but um, it was in Omaha. So we went, uh, I went with Dave's siblings, his brother, two brothers and sister and it was fantastic. These guys just embraced us like we were part of the family and told us all these amazing stories and how important Dave still was in their lives. And um, it, uh, let's see, where are we in that? Um, they, and they also told us it was the first time we had heard any first person accounts of what had actually happened to Dave. And I really, the thing I regretted the most was that Dave's parents had already died and they had never received first person accounts of, you know, why was Dave in that bunker that day? I mean, his father was, you know, his father knew exactly what the situation could be like. And so he wanted an answer to that question, but he never got it in his lifetime. Um, next slide. So uh, when I went to that first reunion in 2006, it was an extraordinary experience meeting these guys. And this picture actually is from a subsequent reunion that we did. But the amazing thing about this picture is Joe was actually, the guy, and the guy in the white shirt, he, was, he carried the code book for Dave. And uh, the guy behind him with the beard, he was a, 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 platoon, a first lieutenant platoon leader. Uh, the guy next to him, with a name tag, he was Dave's track driver. And in this picture, these two guys were wounded in a, um, the guy in the yellow shirt and, and Joe were wounded in a firefight uh, where they're both taken out, you know, um, in, a, you know, in the dust off helicopter and they were both in really bad shape. And Joe in the white shirt said that, that, that Tex, the guy with his hand, had was bleeding on him from above and he kept yelling tech stay awake stay awake and they went off and they were sent to different hospitals and from that moment they were very good friends in in vietnam they never learned that the each had survived and so the guy in the beard in the back was the finder for the, for the company and he found these guys and finally it took him years to convince them to come to a reunion and finally did so it was an extraordinary, um, just to, to hear these stories. Uh, next slide, so I can figure out. Ah, and so when I told them, I told them finally my story and what I did and what I did with the letters and, um, and that I put pictures in there and they started sending me pictures. So they started sending me all their pictures of Vietnam um, this picture actually wound up on the cover of the book, and that's Dave in the center there, and uh, Phil and dr the driver down here. Um, <clears throat> and sorry. Um, and uh, so, the next slide up. Uh, also, there's several more slides. We'll just go through. These are some of the slides that stay down in the bottom there. They, they sent me all these amazing uh, pictures that that um, that gave me a sense of what Dave actually lived while he was in Vietnam. Um, and next next slide. 
That's Dave. Um, and then finally, next slide. So they, they, they constructed a whole story for me that I had not actually been privy to because even in Dave's letters to me, which I had a memory of what he had written to me about, I, never, I did not really have a sense of what he was living over there. Um, <clears throat> so um, the uh, next slide. But one of the most extraordinary things is hard to read it in this slide. If you see the track over on the left, you can see in red paint, it says to the Alps. And when I told them, this, the guys, the story of how I had taken Dave's ashes to the Alps, they said, well, do you know that every morning his command in terms of moving out was to the Alps? And they were so happy that wow. he had finally gotten to the Alps. Wow. The next slide shows that track a little better. To the Alps, um, yeah, there it is. The Alps, and and I had no idea that that he had even said that or had written that on his on his track. So um, it was it was extraordinary. Um, so uh, the other thing that came up uh, on the next slide, uh, the other thing that came up was at that first reunion that I went to was they asked me, well, have, you know. Have you been to the wall? And I said, no, and I don't think I'm ever gonna go. And I don't think I can hand, I, I can deal with that. And I found out that many of them had not gone too because they had the same um, feeling. And so um, the guys who were kind of organizing things said, okay, then we're all going. And so they, they um, organized the next re reunion and, 2008 to be in Washington and we would all go to the wall together and when I arrived at that reunion it, this display of these are tiny flags they're only like about about I don't know eight inches high but they were assembling these flags with the name of the person who had died and they were all distributed to be carried to the wall and placed in front of the panels by the guys who had known them. So I had Dave's flag and then, you know, the flags are all passed out amongst them. And um, next slide. And um, this is uh, Lon Oakley, who was uh, one of Dave's platoon leaders. And he went, we all sort of marched to the, to the wall and then Lon found Dave's name and um, next slide. And the thing, thing that amazed me was in seeing the the wall uh, you know it's such a it's such a a sea of names and it's all chronological in order by date of death but even in, if you go to the next slide there's a you can see Dave's name sort of part way down oops oh, oh I'm sorry yeah oh, see, right there next one you can see Dave's name part way down and actually that's Dave's name. And down here, you can see Philip McLeod. And Philip was um, actually in that bunker with Dave when he was killed. So you can, you know, when you, when you back up and you see these people were being killed one after the other, and that's how far apart their names ended up because of all the people that were killed at the same time. Um, so um, next slide. Let's see where I am here. Uh, um, so following that, you know, my, this, so, you know, I'm sort of being cracked open in terms of my, my I'm no longer uh, totally silent about who I am and what, you know, what uh, I experienced. And so I actually began to look around to find out about other Vietnam War widows. And I discovered the Gold Star Wives organization and um, joined. And then I became involved with them in terms of sort of some um, over the years. I'm now the uh, editor for the national newsletter, but this was, this picture is pretty extraordinary because this woman in, in um, closest to us with the yellow shawl, I learned her, her story was that she was 17 when her husband was killed in Vietnam. And when his body came back and he was an orphan, he didn't have uh, parents or family. His body came back. 
she was not allowed to receive his body because she was too young. And she also, I mean, she, he was, a, he was, a, you know, he was a, a, just a, a GI. Um, he wasn't an officer and she was never informed of her benefits. Um, and so it was through this organization, the Gold Star Wives, that she met a Gold Star Wife at some point. And that was when she um, received an education about what, you know, what she should be entitled to. And it was years and years later, but she then um, was able to um, receive those benefits and, and recognition for, you know, what she had experienced. Wow. So... Uh, Next slide. Oh, okay. So this is Noah. He's, he's, I mean, he's now an actor. He, this is when he was shooting, uh, filming Nikita up in Toronto. And Noah is still on me about my writing. And he's, he's reading everything that I've written. He's, he became a wonderful editor. Um, and of course he knew me, obviously, <laughs> very well. So he was just um, always being supportive. And he um, even created a, the trailer from my book, um, which was a wonderful gift um, that you can go onto my website actually and click on it and hear Noah's voice in there. Uh, next slide. And so my book was, uh, memoir was published in uh, 2014. And then of course, I'm really out there. And now I'm getting, um, and in the, in the memoir, it's, it's basically the story of my relationship with Dave, but it's also going back and trying to understand my own, um, you know, how I didn't know what Vietnam was and what I, how I was raised, you know, in a, um, you know, in a family that were descended from Quakers. And at the end, I included, um, uh, a lot of the comments that Dave's, uh, the guys in Dave's unit had made about him and tried to share their stories too. Um, so next slide. And we had the book launch and Noah was there to make sure I didn't sneak out somewhere and avoid <laughs> the public, um, very supportive. Uh, and then next slide, uh, next slide, I then I was, very soon invited to the White House along with 12 other um, Gold Star Wives for Memorial Day, which was an amazing event with, um, the, they really do a great job of keeping the silver polished at the White House. I was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and I also uh, was able to give my uh, a copy of the book to President Obama and his wife and, uh, and uh, next slide and had my picture taken and with him and uh, discovered when I spontaneously put my arm around him, what a skinny guy he is. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say, beef up, we need you. <laughs> right. Right. Then, um, and then I did um, also win the, my mother's always loved Benjamin Franklin and I won the independent book publishers of, Benjamin Franklin Award for the book. But one of the other things that happened at that meeting in Washington was that um, I met Sybil Stockdale. And Sybil Stockdale is an extraordinary woman. Her husband was um, spent seven and a half years under torture as POW in North Vietnam. And you know he came back and later became president of the Citadel and eventually ran for vice, vice president, actually. But Sybil, it, at the time that her husband was taken captive, the policy was that wives could not talk about their husbands. They couldn't talk to the press. They couldn't, they couldn't say anything about what was going on. And it had something to do with policy in the way that, you know, we were operating at that time. But Sybil finally said, enough of this. And she started talking and publicizing the mistreatment of US, because she knew something about how they were being mistreated. And she started publicizing that. And she, um, and also she, her goal was to improve um, American policies concerning the treatment and the handling of POW families. And she 
was the, really the single voice. And I remember that Chuck Hagel, who I also met at the, uh, said that she was, if she, Sybil spoke, you listened, you know, and anyway. So um, next slide, Let's see where I am. Oh, 2016. Yes, Noah's career is, is continuing. He portrayed David Bowie in uh, this uh, series vinyl in 2016. And, um, uh, next slide. Uh, and then actually in 2017, I had been working on a book for a few years, uh, which is a, photographs of people who work and live in the region of Yellowstone. And it was something that I was invited to do. Um, my brother is a, a part interpreter ranger out there. But what really was astounding about working on this book was that I met many Vietnam veterans who had gone into the wild. When they came back from Vietnam, they had to be, they couldn't live. I mean, one guy told me, I couldn't live with people. I had to go and he was working with grizzly bears actually. So that was, that was a really uh, extraordinary thing too. Um, next slide. So from, if you read my book, you'll, you'll read that I say that I'm never going to, um, dig up the letters that I buried in 1969. And I'll tell you just as an aside that I actually did dig them up in 2011. And um, mainly because the, when I met the guys, they kept saying to me, you gotta dig those letters up. We wanna know what he said about us. <laughs> but anyway, that's a different story. But then and I also said I would never go to Vietnam. But in 2019, the 50th anniversary of Dave's death, I decided to go. And I went with a, uh, or, uh, a group that was organized by a Vietnam veteran. And it was, that was extraordinary. Next slide. Um, because we went to, we went to, uh, uh, this is in Kuchi tunnels. And the thing, this is a B-52 bomb crater. The Kuchi tunnels now is kind of like a, just a little bit like Disney World and, and uh, you know, it is like the, I don't know how it is with the pandemic, but it was a tourist Mecca, you know, and, and they um, do this kind of extraordinary uh, job. <laughs> but what, but I did get to, I did get to go into uh, a bunker. And that was what I wanted to feel was what it was like to go into that space underground and to imagine, you know, how one medic could have dealt with, you know, four people who had been blown apart. And um, so, and again, also on this trip, I wasn't even sure why I was going, but all of a sudden I had this sense, I, okay, here's an opportunity to go, I'm gonna go. Next slide. And um, let's skip to the next slide. And the other amazing thing, this is Tong. He was one of our guides and amazing young guys that, that who were our guides, smart, wonderful people. And he told me this story um, that his father who was in the North Vietnamese army uh, had come back from the war, totally broken and um, abusing his mother and, um, and very, very, uh, uh, you know, obviously suffering from post-traumatic stress for many years after the war. But when Tong became a tour guide, he said he was approached by these, by um, some American GIs to organize in a, a time where they could go and talk to someone who had been in the North Vietnamese army. So Tong approached his father. And at first his father said no. And then he finally said yes. And they, this group came together. Tong's father wore his uniform, his, his, uh, comrades came in their uniforms and he said they had hours of talk with a translator and ended up you know in tears at the end embracing each other and his father told Tong that it helped to move a stone in his heart so uh next slide yeah so then the other thing that happened in 2019 was I went back to the Iger and I went with Dave's family his brothers and sisters. And we went, tried to go up as far as we could to the spot where we had taken the uh, ashes. And we took the book too, uh, the memoir and, and, and left that up there. 
Um, and that was a, that was a, it was a wonderful experience too. Next slide. Uh, so these are some notes that I have kind of gathered as my principles about, you know, writing uh, that we, things are revealed slowly. And sometimes you, you just have to let things happen, you know, let yourself uh, do it when, when you can. Um, a significant event like uh, what happened and what's happened to many of us, it just happens too fast to incorporate it into your understanding, you have to give it time. And that, that this process of writing memoir is unpacking and, you know, interrogating what happened and what shapes our life. Uh, next slide. So as Hemingway said, to know what you really felt rather than what you were supposed to feel or had been taught to feel is the real goal. Uh, next slide. And this is Annette's wonderful book that she did with um, uh, joining her poetry with her brother's letters. And when Annette found me on the internet, again, it was just an extraordinary thing. She sent me these letters and said, you know, I think I want to do something with these. And I, I was so moved. And the fact that Peter, her brother, was my husband's company clerk and had known him for six months almost in, um, in Vietnam was just extraordinary. But it is a really wonderful, wonderful book. Next slide. It's, oh, and that's just the, just, just to let you know that Noah's career is flourishing in spite of the pandemic. And if you wanna see him, he's on the end game on NBC. <laughs> <laughs> and he's still the wonderful guy that he's always been still supporting, you know, my, my creative efforts. And uh, he's playing a character that's pretty despicable, but it's not really him. <laughs> and that's uh, how to be in touch with me. Very good. Very good. And yeah, I, I know that uh, Sean put your website into the chat here on the zoom side, and I'm sure he will on the Facebook side too. Um, I know that we have comments and questions, but let's make sure that we get Annette in here uh, because Annette, you didn't know at first, right? When you contacted Ruth, because Ruth is involved in publishing, you didn't know that the relationship that your brother had to David Crocker. Well, I knew part of it. Um, I know that um, my brother, Peter talked about David Crocker and um, I think Laura, his daughter is on here. Laura can attest to this, that um, Peter wrote these letters home and my parents kept them in their safe deposit box. So I had read them many times. So at one point in 1998, Peter went to, uh, and he wrote in his letter, he sent a letter home around May 17th of 1969 saying, Oh, we had this fabulous commanding officer. He just, he's a real person. He treated us with respect and dignity. And he, yet he understood that this war wasn't winnable, that whole thing. And so he was just torn apart when he was killed. So that came home in a letter. So I know over the years, Peter had talked about Dave Crocker. And in 1998, and I think Laura, you might've been on this trip. Um, his family went to the Vietnam wall and this is a slip of paper that fell out of the back of his photo album when I was working on these letters. The pandemic gave me a time to focus on, on this book. And one day I'm just sitting here in the middle of winter, you know, and this falls out and I go, oh, Dave Crocker, he talked about him a lot. In fact, when he went to the wall, I know he did rubbings of Dave Crocker and the other two men on this slip because he had those hanging in his family room in his house in Iowa. So I knew Dave Cracker was really important to him. And I thought, well, I'll just Google the names of these fellows and see what comes up. I was just curious. And um, of course, Dave's name came up. And then I look and then I see the name Ruth Cracker pops up and I go, oh, that's interesting. So then I look a little more, oh, she's got a website. And I look, oh, she's written a book. And then I go, oh my goodness, she's a book publisher. So I, I emailed Ruth just out of the blue and thought, well, I'll see what happens. And in about 15 minutes later, I had a reply. Yeah. <laughs> you must have been at your computer, Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> and 
and there we have it. So that's how we met was that if that slip of paper was there and I knew it. And Laura, were you there at the wall that day? Uh, I don't know if I was born yet. Wait, 1998. 98. No, I wasn't there. But um, we did have, yeah, we had the rubbing of the name. So I recognize the name from seeing it like every day of my life. <laughs> and I know that. Um, so how about that, Ruth? That affects <laughs> Laura every day of her life. I mean, oh, this is just. <laughs> that's, a, that's really amazing. And so Laura is Peter's daughter. Thank you, Laura, so much for joining us. He's um, her, um, he's Peter's youngest. Yeah. Right. So, um, so I'll just start here. Um, my family was involved in the military. My parents met in the military. That's why we're here. And I think the point um, that I think I made with this book is that wars shape our families. You know, whether or not you have a family and who meets whom and I, you know, if my parents hadn't met, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somebody else, you know? And um, so anyway, you can move to the next slide. Yeah, your mom was an army whack. Your father also was in the army in World War II, right. correct? Yes, and um, he was an officer and they met and she was enlisted and they weren't supposed to be, you know, she said, oh, I can't date you because um, you're an officer and I'm not, but he kept pursuing her and he kept showing up. Like he was in, oh, uh, she was in uh, Harrisburg and he was in New York and they'd take the train down and well, this went on and on. Right. Finally, she, her commanding officer said, if you don't date him, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so she dated him, the rest is history. So anyway, my brother was born um, in 1945, just uh, they got married during the war. So it was, just, you know, the war wasn't quite over yet. So he's at the very, very beginning of the baby boom. And um, he went off to college. Um, he graduated in 1967 with a journalism degree. And he was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and that was 67 was the year of the big Dow uh, protest. Students were protesting Dow, a chemical being on campus, recruiting people because they were making um, napalm and Agent Orange and so, and it was a peaceful sit-in but it turned violent. So it made the national news. Um, so then he gets drafted and he gets, uh, so in 1967, he takes some time off in the summer and he goes up in the wilderness up in Canada on a canoe trip with a friend. And we wonder, is he going to come back? Well, he did. And he knew, you know, Vietnam was, was bad at this point, 1967, we knew things were going on longer than they should. So he goes off to basic training and, uh, this is samples of some of his letters and um, he goes to officer candidate school, but then he does not become an officer. He, he leaves that. Uh, one of the reasons being that he was told that a lot of commanding officers don't make it back because they're leading people into, uh, into the, leading the charge into danger. So his first letter home, he's got, uh, he's in the 22nd, 25th infantry. He's in the 22nd infantry the same that, that Dave later joins, but Peter has gone um, a little earlier. So they have their uh, Tropic Lightning is their logo and it looks like a palm leaf with a lightning bolt on it, but they called it the electric strawberry. So you can uh, go to the next slide. So there's Peter after um, basic training, he comes home to Wisconsin uh, for Christmas and um, and he goes into uh, advanced infantry training after that. And then they have to sit and wait. And he goes, no one has anything to look forward to except Vietnam. His letters home are absolutely wonderful. And the, I mean, they're, they're a big part of this book and I really enjoy reading them. He sounds much older than his 22 years in these letters. Well, and he was, you know, he went through, you know, he's a college graduate. So he's a little bit older than some of the the late teen age uh, soldiers. Um, he had political science classes and, and writing classes, journalism, advertising, that kind of thing. So um, you can go to the next slide. Here's uh, July 16th, 1968. This is the day he's leaving for Vietnam. And this is before selfies. So we all have to have a picture with him, you know? And uh, 
because we think this might be our last picture with him. So it was hard. My poor mother, um, she cried for a week. I mean, oh. I, unconsolable because oh. her brother went to World War II and was missing in action and never came home. Oh boy. So this was devastating. So we're looking, and, and I'm just, um, uh, it's 1960, 68. I've just graduated from high school. I'm 18 years old and I'm saying goodbye to him. He's my only sibling. So it's my mother, and my dad before selfies. So he leaves on July 16th and he arrives in Vietnam on the 20, on his 23rd birthday, basically. Mm -hmm. um, he arrives the day before his birthday. So what a birthday. So he flies into Saigon and they get shipped around a little bit. They go to Tan Sanut and then he's up in Dao Chiang. And that's where Dave Cracker was in that same area. And Tainan is up there and they had, um, this was right as the Tet Offensive uh, attacks were happening, 1968. So he's landing the summer right in the middle of some of the bloodiest battles there were. And he's infantry. So you can move ahead to the next one. He writes, um, that little card there was his first card he sent home and he writes, Vietnam, the last line of his thing is, Vietnam is terrible. Everything smells like garbage, including your body because of the heat and humidity. And he worried about the, uh, the heat as much as he did about battle because we're from Wisconsin where it's, he likes cool air and hunting and skiing and things that are all winter. Yeah. So it was hard. So then here he is, here, one of his first letters he writes home about the 2nd Battalion of the 22nd Infantry is mechanized. There's one armored personnel carrier for each squad. It was also called a track within a platoon. So that in one company, there were 16 tracks and the track serves as the squad's house. We sleep eight men in our track at extreme close quarters. Hammocks and ammo cans seem to make the best beds. And here is an actual, he sent, he has this wonderful photo album where he writes in captions of all the names. So here's one, Captain David Cracker with the headphones. And then he, of course, they're out, this is how they're moving through the jungles. And he describes just horrific battles from the day he gets there. And now Dave doesn't come till January, but Peter's in the middle of it, like, in July, August, September, October, just horrible battles. And um, you have some sea rations there. And I didn't really notice that photo until I put it in the PowerPoint. If you look carefully how the person's holding the box. <laughs> Would you look at this? What they thought of sea rations? Yeah, that is very... <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that the first time I looked at the picture. I know. And I thought I'd been working with these photos. And, you know, from the time that he came home, um, those letters my parents kept, he didn't really want to go back and read the letters, but I read them over and over and over, almost to the point where I feel like I've been there, except yeah. for the yes. terror and the fear that yes. I could never experience what he experienced. Right. So I've right looked at these. So here's again, these are all his photos, a wonderful album. Um, so again, some examples of tracks. Those, then, those look like a lot of guys to squeeze into one track. Well, think they're sleeping in there. I, I mean, think about that. How in the world? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, and that's where, yeah, you look at how people were prepared for this. So at one point now, Dave Cracker says, you know, I, uh, they wanted to get all the, he wanted to get all the tracks together. He had 16 tracks together going out. Uh, on a sweep so one day he wanted to get a photo of everything and I guess now I heard from Ruth from one of the people that after they read the book said oh that it's a famous photo because we all have this photo and they never after that some of the uh, tracks were attacked and um, they were never together like that again so it was a one one time thing I'm shot so that's um of the unit so Peter writes in um, August 16th, he's only been there a month now and he's fair skinned and uh, as we all are in, uh, in our family. And uh, he writes, the sun is so intense. I just keep burning and peeling every day. The guys in my pl platoon have nicknamed me red. My lower leg has been blistered and infected for several weeks. Ugh. That's as soon as he got there. He winds up going to a field hospital in Saigon to get treatment. 
and that's his first month. Um, so in addition to battles, he's got uh, he's got to deal with with sunburn that's infected. So here's a, a typical you know tracks getting ready to go out, and uh, I just have to read some of his words because he writes it so well. Um, he, he talks about going to um, late in the afternoon, the tracks broke through the far side of the rubber plantation. In the distance, we could hear the volume of fire increase indicating that the ground troops now had made heavy contact. As we moved down a narrow road leading into dense foliage, the whole world suddenly seemed to open fire on the tracks. To be exact, the tracks were caught in an ambush. The enemy had our position on the road zeroed in for mortars. The ambush was sprung by simultaneously firing mortars, RPGs, uh, rifle propelled grenades, um, heavy and small arm and machine gun fire. One mortar landed in front of our track and another behind it. Bullets were ricocheting off the armor and cracking over our heads. Within seconds, our radio was crackling with screams of medic, medic, I need a medic fast. Then hold your fire, don't shoot the 50s, you'll hit your own troops. For Christ's sake, get a medic. We've got a man bleeding to death. The sergeant is hit, his face is covered with blood. God, someone get a medic. Now Peter's writing vivid things home to us. He's telling us everything. And from what I'm hearing when I've talked with Ruth is that Dave, being a commanding officer, had to be a little more careful what he sent home, and he didn't want to scare her. You know, he's married, and I think Carol Wagner talks about that, too, and, um, because if you're married, they're trying to protect each other. Peter was being a journalist, yeah. and yeah. he's scaring the bejeebers out of my parents and right. me. When right. we read this stuff, we're going, well, how are you going to survive? Well, this, this story goes on, and it gets way worse. I'm not going to... Um, I don't yeah. want to traumatize anybody here, but he talks about exactly what happens. Um, so on the next slide, just an example of where they live. And he talks about having to fill sandbags and this blazing heat and what heavy work it was. And um, all the quotes in uh, all the captions and quotes are his. So home sweet house, that's where they lived. And here's October 1st now, he's had several battles they've been in and he goes, each day we keep adding sandbags to our bunkers in anticipation of a mortar attack on the battalion logger site. Everyone is tense and dog tired. The sun burns daily and torrents of rain make the landscape muddier every night. This is Vietnam at present, a muddy stinking hell. So it reads, his, his letters kind of read like a riveting novel. And that's what people have told me. So then uh, you got to appreciate his sense of humor. Here's the Dao Tiang swimming pool. That's the muddy, stinking hell. And there's a picture of a village. And they're um, moving through villages all the time when they're going through sweeps. So that's another thing. Um, so then he has some lighter moments. Uh, I appreciated his humor in here where he has some lighter moments. And he goes, one of the fellows in my squad bought a baby monkey and tamed it for several months. I swear the little imp is human. He sits in the top of the 50 caliber turret when we're moving with the tracks. On smooth portions of the road, he'll sometimes perch right on the barrel. As I'm riding, Tiger is perched on my shoulder, picking my ears and scratching my head for me. I hope when I get a camera, I can send you some pictures of him and the rest of this madness. So they're making the best of it. So I thought about, um, I chose to write poetry. Uh, I'm a poet, so I, I chose to kind of intersperse poetry with this because um, I guess much like Ruth said, I'm trying to make sense of this. And I, it, this has gone on for decades for me of reading these letters over and over and how do I make sense of it? So um, this is a poem I wrote called Pears. Growing up in the shadow of World War II, my brother grabs a pear from the green stamp fruit bowl, pulls the stem out with his teeth and he pretends to throw it, making hand grenade blasting sounds. He arranges green army men on the floor for attack and retreat, plays war games in a foxhole dug into the empty lot next door. As a boy scout, he learns survival, camping out on weekend bivouacs. 
With dead, he hunts pheasant, partridge, and sometimes deer. He becomes a good shot. Like his father, uncle, and grandfather, he grows up to serve in the military. His draft number comes up at college, graduation, 1967. After basic training, he flies off to Vietnam, hastily prepared. He has issued old weapons from past wars, has no rain gear for monsoon season. My parents buy a rain suit and mail it to him. His letters tell of living in a track as they sweep the jungle, rolling through rice paddies, dodging snipers and ambushes. His letters describe mortar attacks, direct hits, and missing limbs. Scouting and hunting skills keep him alive in that jungle. He tells me, you have it easy because you're a girl. You weren't forced into war or that kind of fear. Well, maybe I have it easier, but whenever I eat a pear, I feel his burden. My guilt ignites as the taste of pear explodes in my mouth. Mm. So great, Annette. So Peter has, uh, they have an interpreter, this 13-year-old boy. And look at the difference in height. Um, he's 13, and Peter writes um, again about this. Uh, and he, you can see that we were talking about smoking before. This little boy is smoking, and they all smoked in, in, uh, in Vietnam. Yeah. So he's talking about... Um, there was a group of Arvins, which would be the South Vietnamese that are on our side, and they are providing security for this group of Arvins, and they have to go through a village. And he goes, the sweep approached us from the north. Anyone coming to cross the road where we were from the north had to be kept on that side until the Vietnamese security police had checked their ID cards. There was one hell of a lot of confusion. There always is when we have to handle civilians. Our one 13-year-old interpreter just could not move up and down a defense line a mile long and effectively inform the people why they were being detained. So that's a lot to put on this 13-year-old and everybody else, but one interpreter for all of that. Okay, you can move ahead. On. So then um, he, he describes many more battles of, uh, being on tracks and he gets switched the last minute to be a platoon leader on the track that, that's behind them. And then the track in front of him that he usually is on gets mortared and a lot of the guys get blown up and these are his best buddies. So he's had some huge trauma happening here. Um, so uh, one of his letters, he writes, every time I've been involved in a full scale firefight, every time I've seen someone collapse from wounds Every time I've seen a fellow GI die, I've prayed and asked for God's mercy for them as well as myself. And we were raised Unitarian. So this is some, uh, you know, pretty heavy for us. Yeah. And my parents are pretty terrified of what he's going through. And I am too, because I'm seeing these letters as they come. Um. We had a, a mail carrier that knew Peter was in Vietnam. So Wally, our mailman, would um, ring the doorbell if there was a letter from Peter. So that was, uh, there's another, there's a poem in the book about, I call it mail call, but that was yay for Wally. Yeah. <laughs> I remember him so well. So here are the air, airstrikes. You can look at, there was uh, the helicopter that Boyle Woods was an airstrike. Um, this is what damaged, and he talks about firefights and damaged material. Um, he was really not supposed to, I think, send or take pictures of damaged equipment, but he did and he mailed the film canisters home and my parents got them developed. So um, these are things that probably shouldn't have been done, but, but were done. Um, here's an overview of the Dautian base camp. And then you can go ahead again, another slide. Then I, he's writing to me at the, uh, meanwhile, I've been, uh, I'm a freshman at UW-Madison. The month after he goes off to war, I land in Madison and guess what? It's big time anti-war demonstrations. 
And so we write letters back and forth. So he sends me this letter around or in November saying, my thoughts have been turning to Christmas. Bah humbug. This is no place to be during the holidays. The hot, dry season has begun and it just doesn't stimulate that ho-ho feeling like it would be at home now. And that's one of my favorite pictures. And that's, it's on the cover of the book just because it says so much. You know, it wasn't, he missed the cool air and the snow that we have. And so it was hard. Um, so I'm on campus. Oh, go ahead. The, the one before that. Oh. You, you. Okay, so I'm at Madison and it is pretty intense. I'm, my dorm is at the base of Bascom Hill and Bascom Hill is, is the kind of center play, centerpiece building on campus. And so I wrote to Peter and I said, dear Peter, I went to my philosophy class, second floor of Bascom Hall. There was a National Guard guy in riot gear, face mask down over his face, holding a gun with a bayonet standing outside my classroom door. So that was pretty terrifying for me because I'm going, wow, would this guy use this? So um, I wrote a poem called UW Campus Life. It's short. Um, Greek was out. Demonstrations were in. Students weren't rushing into rush week. Pledging was down, fraternities and sororities dwindling. Students pledged instead to march and protest. Cheerleaders at the yell like hell pep rally at the union for homecoming could not compete with hell no, we won't go. And if you go to the next slide, here is um, again, more anti-war protests. And you can see some of the National Guard where I have the arrow and this is out, uh, you know, on the center of campus. So here is my, um, Peter writes me a letter about saying, well, I see you have bayonets and tear gas on campus. And then going, well, I know you have bayonets and tear gas. So that's something we had in common. So I call this poem, Bayonets on Campus. In my brother's shadow at the same Big Ten school, I began freshman year, first time away from home. The National Guard marches up Bascom Hill in formation. They parade in unison like warriors. Face shields pulled down, rifles with bayonets propped on shoulders. My brother sends letters from Vietnam. He has an M16, hand grenades, tear gas, and describes surprise attacks on nighttime jungle sweeps. Mortars crack over their heads in a ball of fire. A landmine explodes under a tank. Mother writes to me of the empty nest at home, says the quiet is deafening. She cries for her son's safety. She cries for my safety. My brother writes, the headline of the Pacific Stars and Stripes reads, bayonets on campus in Madison. As a recent grad, he jests, that sounds about normal. I feel the burn of tear gas, fear guns on campus, guards standing at attention outside my classroom door. Police wield clubs against students. I dodge canisters of tear gas lobbed at my dorm as protesters run inside. I shake with fear during riots on campus. I shake with fear even more for my brother in Vietnam. So here are some more pictures, Peter. They had captured um, some North Vietnamese equipment and. And uh, so there's Peter with an AK-47 and um, there he is with, I, I'm not sure, is that a howitzer? I'm not sure what that is on the right. Can anybody say what that is? Some kind of machine gun, air-cooled machine gun, but I don't know the model. That's a, that's a 50 caliber machine gun, Todd. 50 caliber. Oh, good. Good to know that because, you know, that's the other part. I don't always know the... And I think the weapon on the, on the left is not an AK-47. I think that's a PK, it's it's a, it's a machine gun, not a not a not a. Oh assault. really? Okay, he had it labeled as such, but so I don't know uh, for sure. Yeah, but you can see that drum magazine there makes okay. me a little nervous. He's got his finger on the trigger too. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here we are. There's the track he's living in, and and he's got a cigarette there. <laughs> he quit smoking after he came home. It took a while, but he did. So that's good. And here's a, an aerial view of the Daotian base camp. Mm. And, and then he talks about um, the locals. And this was really good. He had some political science classes and he wrote letters to our, 
neighbors, one of the neighbor's kids had asked, what was the political climate like? And he wrote a really good letter back. And he said that sometimes it was almost like a carnival where people were selling things out on the rice paddies. And here they're, you know, they're at risk. They could be blown up in any minute. And you had you had locals. And, and Peter said that, um, he goes, um, <clears throat> when we leave our camp in the morning, no one except a few officers really knows what the mission is. No one has made much of an attempt to encourage GIs to respect uh, Vietnamese people, their customs, religion, and mode of living. Um, the GI, in short, finds it hard to find any sense of purpose for his presence in Vietnam and naturally loses pride in his work because little, if any, personal satisfaction is derived from it. A favorite GI phrase that is applied to just about any incident is, the hell with it, it doesn't mean a damn thing. Then he continues, another great problem stems from a conflict between the military, political, and social goals. For example, in our... Uh, for example, an army medical team will enter a village of illiterate rice farmers and establish rapport by offering much needed medical help. Next, the VC, that's the Viet Cong, threaten the people's lives for cooperating with the Americans. Next, the military gets wind of the VC in the area. During the ensuing combat, the village and many civilian inhabitants are consumed. What have we accomplished? Nothing except instill hostility in the now suspicious and doubting villagers. In effect, it's a vicious, insane circle. We're trying to proliferate a paradox of conflicting goals. The military and civic minded leaders operate independently instead of cooperatively. And then he says the thought most in all our minds is thinking ahead to the day a freedom bird will fly us back to the world. And then in November, there was a, um, a bombing halt. And he goes, we've had 13 straight days of enemy contact. The first day was November 1st, the day the bombing halt was initiated. So he's seeing that things are not yeah. going well here. And they're just thinking about going home. Oh, we got way ahead here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so... What's the next, um, oh, here. I've got another, um, okay, so I've got another poem here that we're seeing these letters. So now this is 50 years of reading these letters over and I'm trying to make sense of this. And I, so I wrote this poem, Headlines from War. Shocking letters arrive at home with tales of concealed tunnels in Vietnam, Viet Cong ambushes from everywhere and nowhere. GIs are blown up like action figures. Mother loses sleep, riveted to the news. She examines casualty counts, praying it won't be her son. Life magazine features faces of the dead, yearbook style, filling 12 pages in one issue. Campus protests escalate as coffins arrive home, rolling across national TV. Silent with worry, dad shares his son's letters with a local paper. The letters are published. It's one thing dad can do to help other families who worry for their children away at war. These parents call my parents in mutual worry and support. At the university, I go to class, avoid protests and police, stay out of harm's way for my mother's sake. And here are some, the next slide shows some of the headlines. I, I have the original news clippings. Um, when I went back to my hometown of Wausau to do um, a book signing at the local bookstore, there was a woman that came and she was the person that put the letters in the paper. Mm. I met her uh, kind of through somebody, a friend of a friend on Facebook. So it was kind of interesting that she could tell her side of the story. They did not edit the letters, yeah. um, but they wrote some headlines. Wausau GI's unit ambushed by Viet Cong. Um, Wausau GI reflects on the war. While in Vietnam, peace talks haven't ended fighting for Wasa GI. So there was a nice following, people calling my parents. And, um, and then um, just before he came home, he does get wounded. A really horrible thing happened. And it was the two other fellows on that slip of paper from the Vietnam wall were the two guys that were killed at the time he got wounded. So that's. Um, you can uh, so it was in the paper because people were kind of following this it became a news news item 
And when he came home, that was another news item. So he came home, he has a brown star and a purple heart uh, from being wounded. And um, here's a, I have, I don't know if you can see these, they're the chopsticks, I have them right here. I keep these chopsticks. Why do you keep the chopsticks? Well, because th this is the poem um, called Chopsticks of what Peter brought us from Vietnam. You brought home gifts from your tour of duty as if from a pleasure trip. A mini camera for dad, a scarf for mother, and for me, chopsticks from Vietnam. Two slender black sticks, the color of onyx, glistening in my hands, each with inlays of pearly shell, iridescent in marbled gold. They made beautiful tools for eating, people forced into famine, their food defoliated by war. You choked back that year of jungle sweeps and body bags, all of it hard to stomach. But you managed to forge a few gifts, bringing me jeweled chopsticks, tools of sustenance, a souvenir of your survival. And if you go back to that slide, um, Chad, or you can, there's one more after that. Okay, so, oh, then he comes home, back to the world. So now we have to do those before selfies were around. We each had to have a picture with him in his uniform. And then he spread out all the maps that he had. He had topographic maps from Vietnam and he spent hours and hours telling us about where he had been and, and um, the different areas and battles that they'd been in. I think your mom's wearing the same dress she did the first set of pictures. Um, no, she isn't. Okay. Okay. That was a blue and white one, I think. Okay. Um, I'm now a year old. Okay. So now back to the world, our next door neighbors baked a welcome home cake. And then a couple days later, it was his 24th birthday. And you can see I'm Aww. pretty happy, pretty happy to see him in the, for real. Oh, how great. So, and then, um, I just would, I would close. I got a couple other things I'd say about why and how I wrote the book, but I just wanted to share this since we have my grandfather, my mother's brother who was missing in action, my mother, Peter coming home, my parents, and I guess I just wanna kind of share this. It's the last poem in the book called On Behalf of a Grateful Nation. One for my grandfather, one for my uncle, one for my brother, one for my mother, one for my dad. Tightly folded into 13 triangles, Fabric snapped, folded in precision, hand over hand. Stars for our states face outward. Stripes of the original 13 concealed inside. White gloved hands extended on behalf of a grateful nation. Never heard what was next. Emotion overtaking the undertaken. Thanks for their service, their sacrifice. Constellations confined inside isosceles of glass and oak, three cornered, shadow boxed, each grief contained. And I have to say that my brother passed away in 2004 from an Agent Orange related cancer after a 15 year battle of fighting a very rare cancel, cancer that was related to Agent Orange. Yes. And, you know, he died at age 59. Laura, you must have been very young when he died. And I think that's what makes your aunt Annette such a hero in telling his story, because you're telling his, you're, you're not just telling his story, you're kind of finishing his story, I get the sense, as I read your book. And it's wonderful to have the, his letters next to your poems, because his letters are immediate. They're, they're a very perceptive young man who's aware of his environment in an unusually, uh, in unusually acute way. But here you are many years later, his younger sister, able to reflect on his experience in a way that there's no way that he could have done at age 22, 23, 24. And there's a maturity to your voice and it's like you're lending your voice to him. And if you wouldn't mind, I want to read another poem from your book. It's called The Irony of It All. Oh, okay. Returning from Vietnam, my brother saw no flags waving, mm -hmm. heard no cheers, only jeers and stares when they spit insult on injury. 
the 60s hatred of soldier and sacrifice, anti-war, anti-service, anti-anything established, no pomp under this circumstance. The 70s, 80s, 90s, life moved on while remnants of war soured his soul, no accolades until decades later. Too little, too late, he said. The irony of it all, when Agent Orange and cancer consumed him, mourners lined up for hours to view his body. Three days and three nights of prayer and pomp, flag-draped casket, military medallion on his granite stone. Welcome home, brother. Oh, that makes me cry, Annette. Oh. I, I think you're speaking for a lot of veterans. Well, uh, that was one of the reasons I wanted to do the book. Um, my parents, my mother had always said, do the book, do the book. And Peter didn't want to do it because it was too painful. Yep. So her dying wish was do the book. <laughs> so I'm honoring my family. I'm honoring my brother. Um, you are. And I wanted to honor all Vietnam veterans. You are. Because he, he was so torn apart by the lack of welcome home. Oh. And there were incidents that happened in um, 1980. I know this affected other Vietnam veterans. Um, we had hostages that returned home and we had the yellow ribbons and all that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that Peter came unglued. That was one of his major post-traumatic events. Uh, he was living in northern Minnesota at the time. And it just, uh, and I've heard that from other Vietnam veterans because they never did get their welcome home. Um, it wasn't until 2010, uh, there was a big event at Lambeau Field here in Green Bay where the Packers play, L LZ Lambeau it was called, huge. So they had, um, I met some people there and I met a, a, another book publisher and said what I had and they were saying, oh yeah, you, really, there'd be interest in this. So it was really from then that I dug in and started working on this book again. Um, always in the back of the mind. So, but it was to honor and, uh, and I think to leave a legacy for um, Peter's kids to have, to know what he went through. And it gave me some closure, uh, much as Ruth, you talked about just putting some sense to it because I feel like when I was writing those poems, I was having a good visit with Peter. Yeah. And, and you and Ruth, as well as the many of the faces we have on tonight here in, in, in the Zoom room, uh, the hundred Vietnam veterans we'll see tomorrow for Vietnam Veterans Day. You all were impacted by the very special trauma that the Vietnam War generation experienced. And that was the trauma of the homecoming. I mean, you know, different generations go to different wars and war is always traumatizing, but rarely is there a trauma Mm -hmm. as severe as coming home from war unappreciated, unacknowledged, unwelcomed. And uh, that is something that just has, has just damaged uh, the, the country. And, and I think really traumatized a generation. And I think it's books like yours help to heal that trauma. I, and I really mean that. It's, um, well, it's I'm hoping, thing. actually, one of the things that um, there have been so many amazing coincidences, or uh, as John said to me this morning, maybe not coincidences, but Ruth helped me get in touch with other, the soldiers that got in touch with her. Um, and I have heard from so many of those people. One of the so, uh, veterans wrote and said, I was in that battle on page 68, and then sent me a picture yeah. that he had taken. Yeah. Then um, it's just gone on and on. I've met other people that that uh, related to this, uh, that have said they were in Vietnam or they were at Madison at the same time. And it's just, uh, it's been kind of amazing. Some of the stories I've heard, it just keeps continuing. Tim O'Brien said, the great Vietnam War veteran writer said, all war stories are stories really of love. And I just see that in your book and in Ruth's book. I mean, think Ruth of the love when you went to that reunion, when you went to David's, you know, unit's reunion, um, they embraced you as a family member. It's just, it, it's, it's incredible to me that 
the bonds that you know military service in the war for as awful as it is produces and just well I'm and talking- those same guy, the, the same dick nash those other guys who have told me they said you are our sister you have yeah. to come to re- a reunion yeah um there is a uh, triple deuce website and i peter had identified names on on so many photos so i i made uh took pictures of those pictures and they were uploaded to the triple deuce it's vietnam triple deuce.org website and i started hearing from people that saw their names on the photos isn't that great you know? That's so um, great. It, it's just i mean i've had the most amazing emails and stories from people so that has been um pretty rewarding and pretty darn healing you know that after 50 years uh, to to kind of put some closure for me and then for other uh, veterans who said it gave them closure to some of these battles because they didn't have a written record and Peter did. You know, we're five minutes over time already, but I want to make sure I've been Gavin, you've been Gavin. I want to make sure that everybody has a chance if they have questions or want to make a comment about what we've heard tonight. Um, I'd like to make a comment, um, you know, as also a Vietnam veteran's wife, uh, families had no support through all this. And my husband came home with really severe PTSD. We had no counseling. We had to figure it out ourselves. But Andrew Weiss has written a book called Charlie Company's Journey Home, The Forgotten Impact of the Vietnam War on the Wives and Children of Veterans. It's an excellent book for anyone who's still struggling and interviews all these women who were married. Most of them were married at the time their husbands were in Vietnam. Right. Thank you. Hey, um, tomorrow is Vietnam Veterans Day, National Vietnam Veteran, National Vietnam War Veterans Day. Uh, you, you know, reach out and uh, say thank you to a Vietnam veteran. Welcome them home. Tell them you love them. Ask them about their service. You know, do that any day. Larry Guggins, your state president here of Vietnam Veterans of America. I know that you have uh, uh, events taking place tomorrow. Do you have anything? We do. We just have the same thing for uh, Vietnam War Veterans Day in Beaver County at one o'clock, and then we'll be on for the evening event also. Uh, I, I all I can say, I'm I'm riveted by by everything you had again tonight. This. Uh, I flew airplanes, so I wasn't down in the mud that you described, but uh, I will say for, I'm the state president of the Vietnam Veterans of America. I just want to thank all of you for what you're doing. You're doing more for veterans than I think you realize, Todd also and uh, Sean, but you are. You are healing veterans. Thank you for doing that. It's my honor. And I mean, do you know why, Larry, you know, you guys, the veterans have embraced me as, you know, I'm not a veteran. I don't, I'm not a, you know, no, don't come from a military background at all. And the way that you've embraced me is, you know, is just the honor of my life. And I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful for you, Annette, and you, Ruth, Laura. Thank you so much. Carol, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please do join us again. Uh, stay in touch. All the best for Vietnam Veterans Day tomorrow. And um, we'll see you not, if not tomorrow, then maybe Wednesday morning. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for having us on and letting us tell our story. Thank you. Terrific. Stay in touch, Annette. Take care.